This morning on Houston Newsmakers, the focus is on education. You may know Scott McClelland as the face of HEB, but behind the scenes, he's a forceful advocate on behalf of education. He's the chair of the Education Advisory Committee of the Greater Houston Partnership, and in his role at HEB, has helped donate millions toward education in the state of Texas. Collaborative for Children works to influence public policy so that all our children have the same access to educational opportunities, especially for early childhood education. The president of Collaborative for Children is here to talk about that issue and the quality of education for Houston's children. And Children at Risk, the only nonprofit organization that focuses on the well being of the whole child and drives change for children through research and education, among other issues. The director of public policy and government relations is here for the special education edition of Houston Newsmakers. From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. And good morning and welcome to Houston Newsmakers. Hopefully you've had a wonderful Christmas and holiday season and are looking forward to an exciting 2016. I'm excited about this morning's show because the topic for the half hour is about arguably the most important aspect of anything we can do in our community and that's focus on education. Here this morning is Carol Shattuck, the president and CEO of Collaborative for Children, which among other things works with uh, agencies across Texas to raise standards for regulated child care programs and for early childhood educators. Scott McClellan is the president of the Houston Division of HEB, which has donated uh, $800,000 a year to Texas teachers, principals, and school districts as chair of the Greater Houston Partnerships Education Advisory Committee. He's a proactive face of the Early Matters Initiative of the GHP. And Mandy Sheridan Kimball is the Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs for Children at Risk, which since 1989 has been advocating on behalf of all Texas children regarding education issues as well as juvenile justice, mental and physical health and parenting. Thank you all for being here. Happy to be here. I want to start this morning by asking you all a hypothetical situation. If you are going to meet somebody who has no idea about the state of our education in our community, what do you tell them are the most important things that they need to understand? I'd be happy to start. Um, the focus that I would go to is just the importance of the very early years of a child's life and how we now know over the last 20 to 30 years we have been gathering data from research, longitudinal data from children that were in low quality early education environments compared to those in higher quality and we now know that that generates uh, a huge return to a community to the child and their family but also to us as taxpayers mm -hmm. because we're paying less for special education for remediation children as they're grown are less likely to go to prison i mean it they're huge social benefits mm -hmm. by getting children off to a good start in those early years yeah i i completely agree just to put an exclamation point on that is two things kids can't choose the zip code they're born into and who their parents are and in particular we're finding with poor kids that when they enter kindergarten they're actually a year behind middle income and high income children when they start kindergarten and typically you think of kindergarten as being the starting line and you see these kids starting kindergarten a year behind already and kids who start behind unfortunately they're staying behind and they never catch up mm -hmm. and so really our responsibility is for all of Texas youth not just our kids who are blessed to have middle income or high income kids, but all of Texas youth to get a great education. From the child at risk uh, perspective? Sure, I think one of the biggest concerns is that students are not college and career ready. And it's important to note that you don't just start at what are the graduation rates or the dropout rates. Um, you don't just focus on middle school, but it starts at birth. Just like my colleagues have said, it starts with parents um, being educated to help their students develop. Um, it starts with child care and pre-K, all very important. You all work together on the Early Matters Initiative, part of the Greater Houston Partnership uh, Plan. Um, why was that program deemed to be so important and what were some of the obstacles that it was designed to combat? Well, I think the way in which we got uh, started looking at this is we began to look at uh, the needs of business down the road and saying, look, if we can't have a workforce that's career ready, we're going to have problems in the future. We began to look out to 2040 and we said we're going to have a gap in terms of what we need and the workers that are going to be coming into the workforce. 
And so we said, where's the right place to start? And you would say, well, gee, we want kids who are graduating from high school. And we said, and frankly, that's not the place to start. We've got to start early, just as Carol and, and Mindy had said. And so we said, let's look at early education. And that's the right place to start. And so we put a stake in the ground and said the right place to take the, the, the bite out of this gigantic sandwich of education is to say if all kids could be reading at grade level by the third grade, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And so we said, let's make this a citywide initiative. And we got business, and we got not-for-profits, and we got educators all in one room together. And we said, let's all sign up and work on this together. And set aside some of our, our individual goals and work on a meta goal for the city. And it's been amazing to see how people have come together to do that. How does that work? Because your collaborative for children, by the essence of the name, is about collaborating and children at risk. I mean, we've had Bob Sanborn on here a number of times. Everybody's passionate. How has it worked working together with the GHP to make this happen? I think it's worked very well. I think you're pulling together different areas of expertise mm -hmm. that together really can address the business community, education, the nonprofits, as well as our partnership with families, mm -hmm. which is critical, because we all know parents are the first and most important teacher to right. a child. Um, but I think when you look at the early education piece, I think one of the things that we know well, at least those around the Early Matters table, is that it's, it's the part of our education system, because we know those years are so important now, it's the part of our education system that really, with so many moms and dads working, and are not at home with their young children, mm -hmm. it's on the backs of our parents to pay for that. Right. And so we don't fund it to the same way that we fund public education. Head Start is a program we think of that's available for all low-income children, and it's really not. It's serving about 18% of our eligible children. And there's some resources available to help families pay for childcare, but only for about half and then the money's gone. Right. So it's a big expense to really get their children in a high quality program so that there is no achievement gap when they get to kindergarten. And I know that with the children at risk, there are a lot of issues with trying to make sure that children are in productive environments every step of the way, including the early portion. And if parents are working, the quality of the child care that they're getting sometimes can be a determining factor in how successful they can be. Absolutely. And what I appreciate about Early Matters and why it's going to be extremely successful is that we look at early education, but too often advocates or anybody um, pick an issue and say that's the silver bullet. But the reality is there is not a silver bullet. So when you look at early education, there's a lot of different players. There's a lot of different aspects. And this initiative is trying to better streamline how can we help parents mm -hmm. with their education or just resources? How can we make a child care, quality child care, more affordable? and how can we also better streamline that with the public education system. With the Senate and the House now uh, both approving the Every <clears throat> Student Succeeds Act to replace uh, No Child Left Behind, is that helpful? Is that going to put money in a pipeline to help some of the areas where the education system needs it most, you think? I think the one thing that I'll say about it is it is going to provide more flexibility for the states. I think that there was some pushback at the state level that there was a sense that the federal government was trying to control what we're doing with public education. And so it does give much more latitude to the states to design whatever the testing system is, the teacher evaluation system, where all that was really under the control of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a plus for Texas because we do like to decide how we want to do things. And so maybe there'll be some openness to participate in some of the federal funding that will become available through this. We're just starting this conversation. We got the whole half hour, though. We'll, I told them ahead of time, we're going to run out of time. But we're going to have more <laughs> with Carol Shaddock, Scott McClellan, and Mandy Sherrod and Kimball as we talk education, including the cost of early childhood education, who's paying now, and how can every child receive it? when Houston Newsmakers continues. Welcome back to this special edition of Houston Newsmakers where we're talking about education. Let's talk about the cost of education. Carol sent me some information provided by USA Child Care Aware and the website of the same name about some of the costs of early child care education and also the burden on those paying for it and caring for our children. The average annual income for Texas child care workers the kind who provide early childhood education, preschool, etc., $19,740, which, depending on how many people are in that family, 
It's certainly near the poverty line level. The cost of care for an infant and four-year-old totals just under 15.5. That means more than 78% of that child care worker's income will go toward infant and preschool care. So that's two separate issues there. The cost of preschool education and the challenge of paying the people who are caring for our children, that is a monumental challenge to overcome. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy one to overcome, is it? Mm -hmm. No. No, and I think that's part of what I was alluding to earlier is that um, if you think about what we invest as a state and as a country in public education starting with K through 12 and for half a day in pre-K, um, child care doesn't have that kind of resource. Mm -hmm. You know, that really is on the back of parents to pay for the cost of care. So where do you push but other than salaries? The, the early matters work to try to make companies aware of that need? What role does early matters play in trying to change that paradigm, if you will? Well, I think one of the things early matters are looking at is the quality of child care that's being provided because there is a price quality relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do have your child in, in early child care or, or pre-K, you want to make sure that it's not just uh, babysitting. You want kids to get something out of it. You know, for a, a poor child, by their fourth birthday, they're hearing 30 million fewer words than a middle income or a, or, a, or a wealthy child. And that's part of what's contributing to these children starting behind other kids. Mm -hmm. They're starting uh, kindergarten with a vocabulary of about 1,500 words versus a middle income kid of 66,000 words. And so they really are starting behind. And so if you look at the number of hours that a child care provider has to go through training before they get a certificate, 24 hours. If you look for a cosmetician, 1,500 hours. Wow. So, you know, one of the things you're saying is, that, gee, it's okay to not have a highly certified child care provider, but it's not okay to have a bad hair day. You know, and there, therein lie the trade-offs and where is a society we're saying what's more important to us that we look at. And so that's one of the areas we're looking at at Early Matters is to say, look, we think that kids who are going to child care, it's important that they have a good experience, an enriching experience that's going to help ready them for kindergarten. And Mandy, I looked at your site and I know that a lot of what you do in, in, in addition to just educating everyone, especially parents, about the necessity of having that quality early childhood care. Absolutely. So as an advocate, we're talking about quality, and quality is extremely important and what children need. And the reality is that it's also costly. And so when we have nearly 50% of children living in low-income families, how are these parents able to mm -hmm. afford these quality programs? Um, we've got to work as a community to address that need, but then also the state of Texas um, needs to be able to invest in those child care centers, those subsidies. It's good for the workforce so that parents can go and work, but it will also um, allow quality opportunities for these kids. How's the advocacy effort working in that regard, trying to get the state to provide more money for that? It's a conversation that is being had. Um, last legislative session, pre-K was a priority of the governor, and that's extremely important. There were some great strides that were made. More can be done, um, for example, full day quality pre-K. But the reality is you can't just start at pre-K. As Scott was talking about, it starts before then. Mm -hmm. And so if the state is going to invest in programs, we need to make sure that they work. Children can't, families can't afford um, to have the state invest in programs that may or may not work. And so how can we better streamline child care and public pre-K is important. And we, uh, Cabral, one, one important point I want to make is, let, look, let's not undervalue or underestimate the importance that parents play. You know, we talk a lot about child care centers. We talk a lot about pre-K. We talk a lot about school systems. But the fact of the matter is, is that parents' roles play a vital role in a child's development also. And that's something that Early Matters is working on also. Uh, if you look at just the importance of reading to your children, talking to your children, I talked about this 30 million word gap. That can be made up at home. It's not just the responsibility of the child care center or the pre-Ks. Parents can play a role. Mm -hmm. Something that we found that we're looking to roll out is a, it's an app that falls on, on your phone called Re Re Ready Rosie. And it sends out a one minute video to parents to look at every day and you watch a one minute video of an activity that you can do with your child. Something as simple as lay four coins out on a table and you talk to your child about which one is the biggest, 
which one is brown, which one has a rough edge. The next day you lay out four pieces of fruit and you talk to them. But it gives a parent an idea of something, an activity you can do with your child every single day that's developmental and will build cognitive skill on an everyday basis. You started what I was going to get to uh, here in a moment, and that is, what can you do to make a difference? That's the question. Our panel with final thoughts about what it will take from you to see your children and our next generation poised to do great things. When Houston Newsmakers continues. KPRC Channel 2. This is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. We've been talking about education. Take a look at what happens for those students who are considered at risk. The College Bound from Birth program of Collaborative talks about this. For those students who are at risk, they are 25% more likely to drop out of school, 40% more likely to be a teen parent, 60% likely, more likely to not go to college, 70% more likely to be arrested for violent crime. That is a negative cycle that really should say everything you need to see about what we need to do about making sure that our children start out in a good way. Right. What's the solution going forward? Now, you're collaborating, doing what you're doing. We're making progress. Are companies now more aware to the point where their employees are given more opportunities to do this? Are they becoming more educated about the need for early childhood care? Well, I certainly see it on our board of directors, which is made up of corporate executives. I mean, they really see through their companies, and as Scott has referenced, just the importance of uh, that ready workforce doesn't start there, and we're seeing more and more who get it that we've got to start earlier. And so I do think with, through things like Early Matters and through successful programs that really do make a huge difference in terms of improving the quality of mm -hmm. child care, giving parents the information that they need to make good choices mm -hmm. about child care, we can make a huge difference. And you talk, you, Upskill Houston is another GHP uh, project, and they're talking about it's another level of education. Yes. It's just a different kind of education, right. is it not? It is. Uh, what it says is that, look, between now and, well, in 2018, 65 percent of all jobs that come available, new jobs in Houston, are going to require a two-year or four-year degree. Twenty percent of, of kids who are graduating from high school are going to go on to get a two-year or four-year degree. That's a huge gap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that Upscale Houston has said is that, look, you don't necessarily have to get a four-year degree to get a good-paying job. There are welders, there are computer programmers, there are uh, tech jobs that you don't have to get a four-year degree in. So they've worked with businesses to identify these jobs that are coming available that may not require a four-year degree and are working with uh, uh, community colleges to develop curriculum to fill these gaps. Mm -hmm. And it's working out very well. Now, when I say 20% of kids go on to get a two-year, four-year degree, right. if you're poor, chances are one in ten you're going to get a four-year college degree. And that is just, that's abysmal, right? right and right. we just shouldn't stand for that. And, and all the more reason to start young, like we're talking about. And I know that uh, children at risk, you really keep people's feet to the fire in terms of saying uh, the ratings that you have about how well children are doing, going especially to graduate from high school. Absolutely. So we're um, very intensely looking at graduation rates, dropout rates, and we're looking at school performance. And one thing that we see that can really make a difference is expanded learning opportunities, and that can be before school or after school programs. Early education, but also elementary, middle, high school students, how can they get that quality time on task to help them successful? Mm -hmm. This process, you're optimistic? Are you all optimistic? You're pretty optimistic people. <laughs> I mean, I found that to be the case. So, you're optimistic about where we're going with this? I am. Um, I have been working at this for, you know, 18 years now. And so, to see the level of executive leadership, corporate leadership that's involved in this issue, and the excitement about the possibility of rolling up our sleeves and making a difference at the state legislature, really looking at some of the regulations that need to be changed, and we're really, I mean, there's a real willingness and spirit of working together to get something done. And, and the number of superintendents that are yes, involved. That's true. Absolutely. We have seven different superintendents that, that come to almost every single meeting that we have. I don't know how many not-for-profits there are in the education area, maybe 150, but they were all acting independent of each other, and now we're getting collaboration amongst them and saying, you know what, this is kind of where I'll work, you might need to move over and work here. 
and now we have more businesses that are involved. And so it, it really is a citywide effort. You know, we, Texas did this once before with Don't Mess With Texas. You know, and so in Houston, we've said, look, reading at grade level by the third grade. It's something we know we can do, and uh, we just need to make the voice louder. I want to make sure we have information for all these organizations represented here this morning. To contact or find out information about Collaborative for Children, and the web address is collabforchildren.org. Phone number 713-600-1100. And if you're interested in any of the educational initiatives of the Greater Houston Partnership, they've got one of the easiest websites that you can ever remember. It's <laughs> Houston.org and their contact number 713-844-3600. And for children at risk, several offices, not only here and in Houston, but in Dallas and Fort Worth, the Houston contact information is childrenatrisk.org. The phone number is 713-869-7740. We'll have it on our website as well. I've really enjoyed this conversation this morning. Hopefully you have as well. Thank you, Carol, Scott, Mandy. Welcome. Appreciate Thank you coming you. in. Happy to be here. Hopefully your exuberance will rub off on all the folks who've been watching today. Coming up, final thoughts and a glimpse ahead to next week when we look ahead to great organizations you might want to support in 2016 when Houston Newsmakers continues. For next week, we focus on several nonprofit organizations that you might want to invest your time and or your money in in 2016. Some names you'll know, others you may not know, but all deserve your consideration for support as we kick off 2016. I hope you'll tune in. My thanks to Carol Shattuck, Scott McClellan, and Mandy Sheridan Kimball for joining me this morning. If you'd like to see previous shows or get information on today's program, go to clicktohouston.com and under the news banner, click on Newsmakers. You'll find the contact information for the organizations represented on today's program. Have a great day, everybody. I look forward to you to be back here next year. Be safe, and I wish you a happy and prosperous new year.